Um, mitral stenosis uh, is something we see here in our valve clinic every week. And I think a little bit of that, it's a referral bias, but um, these are not patients who are from uh, parts of the world where the disease is endemic. These are people who grew up in Southeast Texas and may or may not had access to care and then present either as young adults or, or middle-aged adults um, with symptomatic uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis. So it's certainly um, something that we still uh, live and deal with every day. But I'll spend a majority of the end of the talk talking about an unmet need, and that's treating non-rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis, and particularly the early experience with transcatheter mitral valve replacement um, with the uh, uh, Mayra Guerrera generously sort of sharing with me her early data and slides um, looking at that problem. So here's just an example of, of how uh, mitral stenosis might be underestimated. And this is looking at um, children in Mozambique. And what you can see is that if you screen them clinically, uh, meaning symptomatically, you, you find a handful, maybe uh, four or five cases per thousand children. But if you look at them, um, the ace, potentially asymptomatic patients, but who have uh, morphologic um, features of rheumatic mitral stenosis, you can see it's a, a much greater problem than is actually um, appreciated. And here's the typical appearance of a rheumatic mitral valve with uh, leaflet thickening, uh, immobility of the posterior leaflet and doming of the anterior leaflet. And most importantly um, for us as interventionalists, when we're thinking about treating these people with a, a balloon valvuloplasty, uh, commissural fusion, because this is what you try to split when you do a mitral valvuloplasty. Um, the risk being, you know, splitting other structures like the leaflets is where you get into um, trouble. So here's a typical case of a uh, patient with rheumatic mitral stenosis with the thickened leaflets, the doming of the anterior leaflet, and sort of fixed posterior uh, leaflet. And that's somebody who, if they were symptomatic and otherwise uh, had low risk characteristics, we would offer a valvuloplasty to. As opposed to um, this case, which is, is another example of someone from um, outside of the Houston area, with a uh, thickened, really heavily uh, calcified valve. Problem with, the, and this was a fairly elderly patient and had a bunch, had several other comorbidities where uh, surgical intervention was not ideal. So this is somebody with, who had with a Wilkins score of about 12, who we sort of went back and forth on and, and discussed with everyone, you know, what, what, are, what is her best option? And the issue with the Wilkins score, it's sometimes um, misunderstood. It, it has nothing to do as far as predicting the risk of the procedure. It's more a predictor of success of the procedure. Um, so just because someone has a high Wilkins score doesn't mean, you know, it's prohibitive risk. It just means that you have to um, have the frank and full disclosure upfront discussion that there's a good likelihood this won't work, meaning you put a balloon in there, you try to stretch this, and uh, it just recoils and you don't get a, a, any result. So here's her Doppler um, showing a significant diastolic gradient across the mitral valve. And here's her case. And you can appreciate, um, this is the uh, Inouye balloon catheter, the intracardiac echo, uh, echo probe. And you can appreciate this is a heavily calcified valve, um, one you know normally we would not want to approach, except given this person's symptoms and comorbidities. Um, went ahead and treated her and had a, a fairly good result. Obviously, we didn't get a perfect result. We, we went uh, from a mean gradient of 20 down to 9, but enough to at least get her um, quality of life back and get her, uh, uh, keep her out of the hospital. And this is not her, but this is an example of a case where uh, you would have a very successful result. So when we're evaluating mitral stenosis in the cath lab, we do a direct left atrial pressure measurement after a transeptal puncture with a simultaneous left ventricular measurement and uh, calculate the uh, mean gradient between uh, the two sites. And after a valvuloplasty, you hopefully have a result like this without a large V wave, um, as we saw yesterday, which would, which would be associated with significant mitral regurgitation after uh, the intervention. So this illustrates, this um, study illustrates the point of calcification, not increasing risk, but more uh, being a predictor of lack of success. So when you look at this second line here, um, people who have uh, significant um, commissural disease and calcification, 
you get out here to greater than one calcified commissure, the success rate drops down to about 84%. So it's not less than 50%, but it's not greater than 90%, which you expect with the um, less calcified valves. And again, you do not increase the risk of subsequent mitral regurgitation compared to those with uh, less calcified valves. And the most recent, we had a case where we tore um, the anterior leaflet here recently on a uh, mitral valvuloplasty case, and she had a Wilkin score of six. I mean, it, so it's, it's very uh, unpredictable who's actually gonna, gonna tear and who's not, and that's the big um, sort of shortcoming of this procedure. So here would be an example of a heavily calcified uh, leaflet and, app and apparatus compared to in the upper left one that's more favorable. So the most recent ACC AHA valve guidelines give mitral valvuloplasty a 1A, which is a, um, I think as strong as you can get recommendation um, for those patients who have symptomatic severe mitral stenosis and favorable morphology in the absence of contraindications. If they do have any of these, uh, either uh, unfavorable morphology or a contraindication, i.e. greater than two plus MR at baseline, um, they should get mitral valve uh, surgery. And surgery is also indicated for those patients who have severe MS and are going for other surgeries, bypass surgery, aortic valve surgery, et cetera. If they have severe uh, mitral stenosis at the same time of surgery, they would get that addressed. Um, it's a 2A recommendation to uh, treat people with a valvuloplasty who are asymptomatic but have very severe mitral stenosis, you know, valve areas of less than one, mean gradients less than 10. Um, in the absence of or indications, so patients with severe pulmonary hypertension periodically, our pulmonary hypertension group here will, will be working patients up and find that in fact they have severe mitral stenosis, and they'll want us to treat that first before they sort of go down the, the track of treating their um, pulmonary hypertension. So not to go through this, but just so you have this um, as a reference, this is from the ACC AH guidelines. It's the algorithm of approaching those with rheumatic mitral stenosis, breaking it down by severity of disease and symptoms and um, sort of other features like AFib and sort of end up placing people in um, various boxes uh, depending on their uh, characteristics. So that's, that's rheumatic disease and something, as again, um, that we still see here uh, routinely. Um, but what we're seeing more and more of is non-rheumatic mitral stenosis. And this can be uh, from sort of a variety of different etiologies, either degenerative. Calcific MAC is a big one. Uh, we keep seeing more and more of this sort of in these little old ladies um, who come in short of breath with a significant mitral annual calcification and a gradient, a diastolic gradient across their mitral valve. Um, congenital causes, drug-induced, periodically we see um, some people who have undergone, uh, this is interesting, we've seen a handful of these patients who've undergone um, chemotherapy for lymphomas or leukemias and have these, you know, when they have a sort of a lysis syndrome, release a lot of uh, uric acid and potassium, calcium, et cetera, and we've seen a bunch of pe younger people come in with um, uh, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis after that. Radiation-induced, not uncommon, we'll look at a case of that. And then iatrogenic, which we see in potentially all um, these other therapies we offer with um, patient prosthesis mismatch. We have um, here seen cases of post-TAVR patients develop mitral stenosis, which may have something to do with that relationship between the aortic valve and the, and the mitral um, apparatus that Dr. Lari illustrated. And then um, we also have uh, our own cases where we've done mitral clips and induced significant mitral stenosis, um, which, which obviously is, is uh, unfortunate and, and the only therapy for that would be a, uh, surgery. So here is uh, a case of someone with a heavily uh, calcified mitral valve, mitral apparatus, with um, a significant diastolic gradient, but really no obvious, uh, no appealing um, percutaneous um, approach. And really, um, it's my understanding, you know, these are also difficult patients to do surgery on when there's all this uh, calcium. And this is taken from the New England Journal images, uh, sort of weekly um, section uh, a year ago. So this is a little old lady who's short of breath. And she, she comes in and is found to have mitral stenosis, but it's from this huge um, uh, mitral annual calcification, almost tumor 
So is, is this somebody you'd want to operate on? I mean, this would be, a, I'd imagine, a challenging case to dissect and put a new valve in. Um, so what's the alternative? Well, uh, given these uh, issues of surgical risk and difficulty with um, MAC and having uh, uh, challenges of managing the posterior wall and high mortality, most of these patients are either untreated or if they're treated, they're high risk. Um, so Mayra uh, has shown and sort of highlighted the background that people have started trying transcatheter valves in MAC, and uh, this is just a, a sort of a supplement of um, a few of the cases that were described, all with the uh, Edwards Sapien platform. And a summary here of four cases looking at their uh, pre-procedural CTs, quantifying the MAC, the procedure, it was done, post-procedural CTs showing a fairly good result. Um, with good apposition and expansion and uh, no significant mitral, residual mitral stenosis or regurgitation. So she put together um, the transcatheter mitral valve uh, replacement in MAC Global Registry and looked at about a little over 50 patients. And here is the uh, various valve platforms, again, most being um, Sapien in the 26 to 29 uh, millimeter range. And they were delivered um, in four different ways, either uh, transatrially, um, just uh, with a surgery, a thoracotomy through the, um, straight through the atrium, uh, transapically, as is done and, and was shown and discussed earlier, uh, similar to a transapical um, TAVR procedure, transseptally, which, which we've done here um, a couple of times and uh, for mitral valve and valves and then sort of a uh, modified uh, transeptal where there's uh, uh, both a transeptal and transapical snaring the wire um, outside of the uh, apex. So um, she showed a technical success rate of about a little over 70%, uh, LVOT obstruction of about 8%, valve embolization 6%, conversion to surgery 6%. So it's early. I mean, this is really sort of groundbreaking um, stuff she's doing. And I think encouragingly, she showed uh, that the mean gradients improved um, significantly in these otherwise very difficult to treat uh, patients, and their symptoms improved. So, uh, you know, this is very early feasibility stuff and things that are, are, are getting moving forward, and I think one of the biggest unmet needs. Here are some examples of problems, and this is from uh, Dr. Bill O'Neill, and, and I always make an effort at the meetings to try to go to any talk, especially any case he's gonna show, because he always shows stuff that gives you goosebumps and somehow walks away clean as a whistle. And so here's an example, here, here's two examples of cases um, that, he, that he's shown and, and loaned to me. Um, here's a uh, issue with um, a, a, a way to overcome LVOT obstruction. And sort of similar in the cath lab when we do bifurcation stenting and we want to protect the side branch or jail the side branch, sort of treat the aortic valve and LVOT like your, like your side branch and deploy your um, stent in your uh, target lesion and get a fairly good result. The other thing uh, he's shown now a couple times is doing uh, alcohol septal ablation uh, after transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And, um, you know, of course, has, has described this in, in successful cases. I, I'd be interested to see how the, you know, the durability of this, because we know alcohol septal ablation in general is not an um, ideal sort of long-term uh, therapy. And this is what I mean where he, he shows cases that um, make you uh, cringe a little bit and then wonder how the heck he got out of there. Um, this is an example of a valve uh, that he put in that embolized. And in order to uh, sort of secure it, put a uh, Amplatz uh, septal occluder through the embolized valve and then just pinned it against the septum and uh, got out unscathed, as he always does. Um, so I think rheumatic mitral stenosis remains a uh, leading cause of heart valve disease in the world, and we see it here uh, routinely. It can be treated with uh, mitral valvuloplasty or surgery, depending on the anatomy and risk. And the non-rheumatic mitral stenosis, which I personally see as the, the biggest unmet need, is challenging to treat, and we sort of await more data as far as transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Thank you.